the name of the Creator, Redeemer and Sanctifier. Amen. <clears throat> Please be seated. When a, when a toddler asked the priest why he wore a clerical collar, the minister exclaimed that, well, it's just a part of the uniform for priests in our denomination. He then removed it from his shirt for the lad to examine. Do you know what it says on the collar? Asked the, asked the priest. The boy, who didn't know how to read, looked at the letters and ran his fingers over them and looked up at the priest and guessed, Kills fleas and ticks for up to six months. <laughs> Naaman was the commander of the armies of the king of Aram, and he suffered from leprosy. It's a bit unusual that someone in such a position of responsibility and control, a general in the army, would be a sufferer of leprosy. We're not sure what leprosy meant when they said that back then. It could have been anything from proper leprosy, as we know it today, uh, all the way down to just a rash that was continual and they couldn't get rid of. Often they'd just lump them all into one big thing out of fear and call them all leprosy. We're not sure which one Naaman had, and it doesn't really matter. Because for the purpose of this story, it's not about his leprosy. The story, the point is, that this story shows us Elisha's mastery over disease and his power of healing. It shows us his superiority over someone as powerful as the commander of the king of Aram's army. But for that matter, it shows Elisha's superiority over the king of Israel. I love that little scene at the start of the reading where the king of Aram writes to the king of Israel, here is Naaman, my commander of my armies. Heal his leprosy. And the king of Israel goes, what? This guy's trying to pick a fight with me. He's, you know, you can see it, can't you? He's asked me to do something impossible. Why is he trying to pick a fight with me? And he tears his clothes. It's a good sign that he's despairing and a sign that he's grieving that he can't do it. Elisha shows his mastery over the king of Israel, the king of Aram, disease, leprosy, healing, but also his power over Naaman. When Naaman finally turns up to Elisha's door to be healed, Elisha won't even come out and speak to him. He just sends out a servant, go and tell him to wash in the Jordan seven times, and he'll be healed. That is the power of Elisha, a powerful prophet in Israel. But I want to tell you, when I read the story of Naaman being cured of leprosy, I'm reminded of another ancient story, not from the Bible, one of the Greek myths. The story of the twelve labors of Heracles. The story goes that Heracles was hated by Hera, the goddess Hera, and she tricked him into slaying his wife and children. Heracles is consumed with grief and also fear for his life for killing his wife and children. So he visits the oracle at Delphi, the oracle of Apollo, and he prays to the god Apollo for forgiveness. And the servant, this, the story comes back, to earn your forgiveness, you must go and be the servant of Eurystheus. I got it right that time. I didn't get it right at 7.30. Eurystheus, king of Mycenae, go and serve him for 10 years. Do whatever he wants. And so Heracles, wanting forgiveness, goes off to serve the king. And while he's there for 10 years, he set a series of difficult tasks to perform. Labours, they're traditionally called. And each one is more difficult than the last. The first one was to kill the Nemean lion, a lion whose hide was so thick, the arrows that uh, Heracles fired at him were not enough to even pierce his, side, pierce his hide. 
And the only way, after he strangled the lion with his bare hands, that he could get the hide of the lion was to use the lion's own claws to cut the hide. Heracles then wore it as a piece of armour. That was the first one, and each one got more difficult. One of them, he had to clean out a set of stables that hadn't been cleaned for years, and it took the diversion of a river to clean the stables out. Each labour, and that was number six, each one more difficult than the last. And Heracles performs each of them and eventually wins fame, fortune, and importantly to him, forgiveness. I'm put in mind of that ancient Greek myth because in our story today, I suspect Naaman had the idea that when he came asking for healing, a sign of forgiveness back then, he would be given a series of tasks to fulfil, each one more difficult than the last. Instead, he's told, go and wash in the River Jordan seven times. That's it. Why was he told to wash seven times? Seven's one of those symbolic numbers from the Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily mean seven, although in this instance he was told to wash seven times. But seven's a symbol of completeness. He's told to go and wash completely in the River Jordan. That's it. That's all Naaman has to do to be healed. Go and jump in the River Jordan, dunk yourself down seven times, and you'll be cured. And what does Naaman do? He gets upset and angry. And then there's this beautiful little parochial rivalry. Aren't the rivers of Abana and Farpa better than the Jordan? They're the two rivers that flow to the north and the south of Damascus, where he was from. Aren't they better than the Jordan? You know, it's like me saying North Queensland's better than New South Wales. Just a nice little bit of rivalry, parochialism going on, right? Think about these two stories, Naaman and Heracles. Think about Naaman's story for a moment. How ridiculous it is that he would be upset. He's given one task, easy and doable. Go and wash completely. That's it. Heracles was given a task of serving a disgruntled king for 10 years and performing a series of labours that just got harder and harder and harder to win his forgiveness. All Naaman has to do to be healed is wash. Here, I think, is the point of the story for us, though. I think we can all be like Naaman, unwilling to go and do the simple thing. We miss out on something good because surely there has to be some complicated labour or task for us to perform. That, that's what we really want. We want it to be difficult. How often do we overlook simple truth for wanting things to be more complicated? In that sense, we all have a little bit of confirmation bias because that's what Naaman had. We come in wanting things to be more complicated than they are, so we reject them when they're simple. There's a saying, I think, that has some relevance here. We cut our nose off to spite our face. But let me give you a real-life example from the past week of what I'm talking about. We were all glued to our TV on Tuesday morning. Just, just the mass nerds amongst us, waiting for the census data to drop. I love data. I think it's awesome. But you've all heard the news, haven't you? And what's the big takeaway for churches? Australia's becoming less religious. That's the story from the first release of the census data. Let's overcomplicate that because that's what we're good at. This data, oh, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Less people now claim some allegiance to Christianity or to faith in general than those who don't. So we start to read into this data things that aren't there. 
It's absolutely terrible. Everyone's turning away from the church. We're all going to, the church is going to disappear and die. I had the chance on Thursday to attend a webinar from McCrindle, the Australian social research company, that gave a free webinar to help us understand and unpack some of what came out of the census. And they reminded us that this was at, a, at its heart one question, an optional question in the census that asked, do you claim an affiliation to a religion? That's it. That's all it asked. It does nothing to tell us how much people adhere to a faith that they claim to have. It asks no question about what people actually, personally believe. It simply asked, do you have some affiliation with a religion? That's all it asked. But in the desire to overcomplicate it, we've started to extrapolate all these things that it might mean, whether or not it means it or not. And they pointed out two stats from the data that I thought were really interesting. The first one is, in the age bracket 18 to 34, there's actually an uptick in those who claim affiliation to religious institutions, an increase. So many people want to tell me faith, religion is for the older people. But it's the 18 to 34 year olds that are increasing. And certainly they're in a, a bigger group of people who claim some affiliation to a church or a religion than my age group. Second thing they reminded us of, that this question doesn't capture what people believe, but whether or not they belong to a particular religion. It did not ask any question about whether people believe in God. It simply said, are you a member of a religion? I want to be honest and say, make no mistake, there is definitely decline in the church. I'm not trying to say there isn't. There's little doubt that our churches are declining. It's just not as bleak as the media has portrayed this week. And this is for me where it really intersects with Naaman's story. What's the answer to the decline in the church? How do we turn it around? Well, there's a new program that'll solve the issue, right? Let's find the new program that'll fix the problem in the decline in the church. Let's invest in that latest program. We watched it we watched it in another church and it, it saw hundreds of people join that church. So we can twist it and we can push it and we can pull it and we can change it. We can do all this massive amount of work and it'll work here, right? And after the 12 labours of changing the program, our church will be full, right? I mean, it'll take more volunteers than we have available here. But once we've done that, it'll fix the declining church, right? A clergy friend of mine and his wife used to say, it's not that complicated. Love people and let the rest take care of itself. And they're right. What's the answer to the decline in the church? Love people enough so that they know that they're loved and they love them enough to tell them that God loves them. Don't get me wrong, programs can be a big help, but they're not the solution. The solution is much simpler. Let me take a program that we've all heard of. We've all heard of Alpha, right? Good program, it's great. But I have to say, I've seen a lot of people overcomplicate it. Oh, well, we won't do it that way here, we'll change it here, we'll do this, we'll do that. We won't won't include the meal. And what if we recognise that Alpha is just a help, a tool to help us tell others that God loves them? What if we accepted that it's just a tool to give us a way to invite someone to come and find out about the love of God? Because that's what it is at its heart. Naaman almost missed out on being healed. 
I thought he'd come out. I thought he'd wave magic words and wave his hand over the spot and I would be healed. And it didn't happen, so I'm going home with leprosy. Just go and wash in the river. You know, another stat I learned recently from the National Church Life Survey, they did some research with the community of those who don't come to church. And of those in Australia that don't come to church, they found out that 40% of that population would come to church if they were simply asked by a family member or a friend. 40% would come if they were asked. And they said a further 16%, they weren't sure if they'd say yes or no if they were asked. Maybe as many as 56% of Australians who don't go to church would say yes if they were invited. If a family member or a friend who loved them invited them to church. Where were the 12 labours? Where was the complication in that? I wonder sometimes if we miss the good that God has for us. And this is true not just of us as a church, but us as individuals. Sometimes we miss the good that God had for us because the answers might be too simple. I was expecting something much more complicated and difficult. And you tell me all I have to do is go and wash in the Jordan? No, it's too simple. The church is in decline. And we're disappearing. And you're telling me all we have to do is love people and then issue an invite to church? Well, surely that's too simple and not even worth trying. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.